reminder to have that sometimes. All right. Well, please remain standing as we read God's Word. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Amen. Matthew chapter 5. And uh, we will read uh, the, the first 12 verses once again. And more than likely finish at least our review of the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was said, his disciples came unto him. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Shall we look to our Lord once again in a word of prayer. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love to us, mercy and grace and watch care over us. We thank thee, our Father, for allowing us the privilege to come into the house of the Lord this evening. And Father, I do thank you for each and every one that is here tonight. Lord, it is such a blessing to have uh, each one. And Lord, I'm just grateful that you have given them the ability to come tonight. And I pray, Father, that you would bless in all that we do. We appreciate being able to sing songs to glorify you and to hear prayers, and to hear your word, Lord. And I ask, Father, tonight that you would be with me as I serve it. You give me liberty and unction from on high to present thy word in truth and in love. Father, I ask that you'd be with those that have been made known unto the church, our members, and those that are visiting with us, and our fellowship meeting that's coming, the flyers that we'll be sending out, the Lord willing. I pray, Father, for uh, Reese's friend's family. I pray for uh, Brother Matt's co-worker, Michael, and his, and his wife. As, uh, she's 22 weeks along, and so we're grateful to hear that and pray all will go well. And Father, I do pray for uh, this coming Lord's Day. We're thankful for the answered prayer and, and having a place to go and uh, to, to be able to baptize uh, Dinah. And so, Father, I just pray that in all of the services, we bring honor and glory to thy name. And if it be thy will, if there are any that are lost and undone without the Lord Jesus Christ, that they come to know the Lord. And, and even, Lord, it be that day that they would want to submit and follow you in the waters of baptism. And so, Lord, we just pray thy will to be done. I ask, Father, that you be with each of us as we go out through, uh, go throughout the rest of this week. And uh, may everything we do bring honor and glory to thy name. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. All right. So tonight we're continuing literally our review on the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And, of course, we started uh, with the, the subject or the study of the Beatitudes. And then we went from there and we went on all the way down through uh, chapter 6 and chapter 7 of the Sermon on the Mount. And so with that, I want to just go ahead and get into it so that the Lord willing, we will be able to finish our review and then, you know, kind of just chop our way through uh, the rest of the, uh, the, the sermon. So we come now to verse number 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. When we think of pure, what is it that we think of? Most of the time, when we think of things that are pure, we think of things that are most likely clean or beautiful, safe, wholesome, unpolluted, uncontaminated, and lovely. So when we think about what is pure, the Bible says, our Lord says to us, blessed are the pure in heart. So the kind of heart that is blessed is the heart that is pure. Of course, this is absolutely the kind of heart that our Savior had while he was upon this earth. 
Our Lord had a perfectly pure heart. Everything about our Lord was pure. Everything about our Lord was lovely. Every thought of our Lord was pure. Every motive of our Lord was pure. Every action of our Lord was pure. And the Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now we know that no inward purity or the, 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 the absolute you know, definition of what, what purity is exists in natural man. Because the Bible says that natural man is unclean or unpure. The natural man is totally depraved. The natural man is a sinner from the top of his head to the sole of his feet and everything in between. And so the natural man would not be considered as one that is pure. Now, there are some that even as lost, they live seemingly moral and or maybe even a pure ish kind of life but the purity that is being spoken about here is a purity that is attributed by Jesus Christ the Lord to the child of God and is given to us when we are saved blessed are the pure in heart and this is something that I think when I was reviewing, and it's been many, many, I mean, it's been over two years, two years since we've been in the Beatitudes, and I was thinking to myself, boy, I'm really thankful the Lord is allowing me to go through this once again. Because I think that it is something that we all can continually work on, and that is purity. We need to be more pure in heart. We need to have more pure intentions as children of God. We need to think on what is pure or what is true. We need to be surrounded by what is pure. And just to be, you know, pure-minded. And the reason that it is so important for us to do this is because our society, our culture, is on a dramatic downcline or decline, downcline, decline, <laughs> decline of purity. Our culture is on a downward spiral in regards to purity and modesty and things that are pure. When we look around at our culture today, when we see what media portrays, when we see the culture from even the early 1900s or the late 1800s, when we look even from the early 19, again, 1910, of course, the 20s, we started to become a little bit more liberated. The 30s, we become a little bit more liberated. By the time you get to the 50s, it's almost Woodstock time, right? And we get to the 60s. 70s, 80s, and you can see in pictures in a timeline of history the decline of purity in our culture. If you were to go back to the late 1800s and early 1900s, and you would have, and you were, and, and the women or the men of that day, if they were to have imagined, let me put it this way, they couldn't have imagined the impurity that we have today. Up to and including mannequins, right, in the department stores, our culture is designed or is, is infiltrating us with impurity. We understand, and then even amongst those that profess Christianity, that modesty is just about a thing of the past, as I'm mentioning. You know, clothing designers want nothing more than to show off more of the human body and showing more and more impurity. Now, I've mentioned the culture many a times, but there's a lot more to impurity than just dress. There's a lot more to impurity, or yes, than, than just dress, right? I mean, certainly we could talk about, you know, the age of, of pornography. Certainly we could talk about... Uh, all the other impurities that are out there today, but 
another dimension of impurity you know, comes even from our language, how we speak, right? I mean, we ought to, especially as God's children, we'll talk about the purity of heart here in just a few moments. Again, these are not full-out messages, but how we talk. The language of our culture has become impure. The language of our culture. The using of the Lord's name in vain, completely impure. The, the absolute, the cursing. Words that, again, were never even thought of less than 100 years ago, less than 150 years ago, are used today. And I know that I'm a bit old-fashioned, and I know that I'm a bit uh, conservative and all these different things, but I'm just going to say a word now not because I endorse the word, but I think, and I find it to be a very filthy word that is used very commonly today that many people wouldn't even consider, not even consider to be an impure word at all. And I would have to say when, when we go on and somebody says something like this, uh, it's just hard for me to say it. Um, it, the action of what a vacuum cleaner is supposed to do is suck. <laughs> and so when somebody goes and says this, Right? It's hard for me to even say that, but that is just common phraseology amongst our culture. It's common phraseology in the schools. It's common phraseology everywhere we go. You go back a hundred years, there's no way those words would have been used. So we are seeing an absolute decline of purity. Lying, right? I mean, when we say, blessed are the pure in heart, would you say somebody that has pure intentions is a compulsive liar? I don't think you would. I would say that killing is an impurity. Adultery, as we kind of mentioned, impurity. Homosexuality is certainly a sign of impurity in our culture. The acceptance of it today. All right? So the Bible says to us, again here, we're, we're just kind of reviewing. The Bible says to us here in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Spiritual purity that I believe God demands is far beyond the mere outward um, manifestations that we have. It is a deep change from within that God grants unto us as His children. It is a change in that we all or that we no longer want to see of all the impure things that I mentioned. That we don't want anyone in the culture to even have impure thoughts especially as God's children. And, you know, that might even be too broad. You're saying, man, pastor, you've got really big intentions. You're right. Maybe I should just say that we shouldn't have impure thoughts in our own homes, right? And if we could get our own homes under control, then maybe we can get the church and not have the church having impure thoughts about others and ourselves and the church and the growth and all these different things. So maybe if we can get those under control, then maybe we can, you know, infiltrate out to the communities. And then maybe if we can get the community under control, right, maybe it'll go out to the city. If it goes to the city, then maybe the state, then maybe the country. But, but ultimately, right, I mean, I can stand up here and I can talk about the impurity of our culture. I can talk about the impurity of the language. I can talk about impurity in dress. And certainly I love to blame the media and I love to blame, um, you know, Hollywood. And I love to blame all these different things. And I love to say, man, if they would just clean up their acts on TV, if they would just clean up their acts in the movies, they would just do all these things. We asked for it. <laughs> As a culture, we have allowed this garbage to go on for so long without letting our voices be heard. So yeah, maybe I do have really big intentions tonight. Maybe we should, <laughs> right? We, we have just seen impurity for so long that it's, it's almost accepted. So, okay, sorry, God, I'm back. Got off a little bit there, I'm back. All right, purity. A sincerity, a genuineness of our hearts. All right.
We're to be pure in our words, in our actions, and our motives. To set our affections on things above. Let's move on. <laughs> Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. This seventh beatitude has to do with our conduct. With our conduct. What efforts are we making to put forth peace? Now, in order for us to put forth efforts of being peaceful, we must ourselves be at peace. And I really, truly believe the only way for us to be at peace is to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our only and all-sufficient Savior. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, the Bible says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I meant to read verse 8 a few seconds ago, but it'll work now. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good rapport, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And so that goes right back to that. But now we're talking about being uh, peaceful and being peacemakers. So how is your peace level this evening? Do you feel at peace with the Lord? God gives peace to His children. God gives to His children a peace that passeth all understanding. I wouldn't expect somebody that is unpeaceful to be able to bring peace. I wouldn't expect somebody that is continually agitated, continually nervous, continually worrisome, even though at times in our lives we're probably all of those things, right? There are times when we are nervous, there are times when we are agitated, there are times when we are stressed and different things like that. But I wouldn't expect somebody that is always in that frame of mind to be able to promote peace. The peace that we want to promote as believers comes from the peace that, that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In John chapter 14 and verse 27, John chapter 14 and verse 27, and the Bible says this, John 14 and verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth I unto you, or not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Our Lord and Savior, so if you're here tonight and you have been saved by the grace of Almighty God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, God says unto you, His child, that He leaves for you peace. And he says, I leave for your peace. And he says, it's my peace I give unto you. That's awesome. He says, not as the world giveth, <laughs> give I unto you. So, right, so again, we're not going to expect the people of the world, the people that know not Jesus Christ, people that are unbelievers, to be able to be the peacemakers that are being talked about here in Matthew chapter 5, but talking to us, believers, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth I, or giveth give I unto you. I mean, I'm telling you, that's awesome, folks. So God makes peace possible for us. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore... Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we have peace? Well, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. How do you have peace with God? By being justified by faith through 
our Lord Jesus Christ. So, grace or uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And God said, our Savior said, that He leans for us, His children, His peace. Peace. Therefore, peace with God is then not bound up by what man can do for himself, but by and through the blood of Jesus Christ. In the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Colossians, chapter 1. The Word of God says this to us. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 and through 22. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether there be things in the earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unprovable, unreprovable in his sight, having made peace through the blood of his cross. The sweet peace that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now I understand, and we've talked that life is tough, but God is able to give us peace that passeth all understanding. I've often said, you've heard me say before, maybe in this message, maybe in other messages, I don't know how people make it through this life without the Lord Jesus Christ. I sincerely mean that, and I have a heart for people that know not the Lord as their only and all-sufficient Savior. I don't know how they make it through death. I don't know how they make it through the tough times. Jesus Christ is able to give peace. <coughs> and so then, beloved, as we continue on in this text, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So we have a responsibility as God's children, having known the peace of God given unto us by the Lord Jesus Christ through His blood, we then must promote peace. We are to give this kind of peace. We are to actively be involved in making peace with people. Now, I told you, it's been a couple of years, right? And I, I really needed, you know, these messages again tonight because <laughs> I have a tendency, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but not, not to necessarily be unpeaceful, but to get excitable pretty quickly when things are... are, are a little excitable worthy, if you will. But we ought to promote peace, that others would see Christ in us. We should want to share the great peace of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, with everyone. God is calling us to be ambassadors of peace. That we are to promote peace. Okay? said I wanted to try to finish, so we're going to try to finish. Here we go. Now these next ones, we talk about verses 10 through 12, we talk about persecution. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now keep in mind, persecution will endure. All right? Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. 
So there is a certainty of persecution. The Bible says that we shall be persecuted. In the Gospel according to John, chapter 15, and verses 18 through 20. John, chapter 15, and verses 18 through 20. And the Bible says here, John 15, 18, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I have said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. The Apostle Paul warns Timothy of the life, if we live a godly life, that we shall suffer persecution. Back or over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And then 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 and verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So the certainty of persecution for all that live godly. We could turn this message and we could go right back up just a few verses. Blessed are the pure in heart. We're living pure lives. Typically, we're living a godly life. But all those that will live godly, all those that do live godly in Christ Jesus. We're living properly for the Lord. And we should not be surprised when we're persecuted. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fire trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you on their part. He is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So as we talk about persecution, as we, as we uh, go down through this, it, it, there's certainty that it will come to the child of God. I might remind you what persecution is not. You might remember some of this. Persecution is not being a nuisance. That is to say, Christians who have shown themselves to be offensive, difficult, and insulting to their co-workers and their neighbors. When you go out seeking to be a nuisance to your neighbors and a nuisance to your co-workers, and then you want to cry that you're being persecuted doesn't really work that way. Right? Persecution is not someone just coming to us and saying, I don't want to talk to you because you go to church. That, that's not necessarily what we're talking about here when we say, uh, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Neither does it mean blessed are those who are persecuted for wrongdoing? You cannot claim persecution because you are arrested for shooting or murdering, say, an abortionist. Abortion is sin, and so is shooting a doctor that performs abortion. Different. Let's say you were at a pro-life rally and put into jail for standing up for the unborn. You might be able to say that you have been persecuted for righteousness sake. You can't claim persecution for wrongdoing. Which leads us to what persecution is. In general, this beatitude is not applying to trouble that you bring upon yourself. The key to understanding this teaching is in recognizing the significance of Matthew 5.10. 
Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness, for righteousness sake. Some people suffer because they make poor decisions. That's not persecution. Now verses 10 and 11 reveal the various ways in which persecution can come against a believer. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. People revile, use verbal insults. If you're living godly in, in Christ Jesus, some will speak falsely about you. They don't want you, child of God, to get the promotion and become their boss. So they will slander you. Some would consider that to be persecution. Some will say all manner of evil against you, harsh, abrasive, abusive words behind our back. So people, for serving the Lord properly, will from time to time speak evil of us. They will speak it falsely because they do not know any better. So, Remember, just before that, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Just before that, blessed are the peacemakers. So even in persecution, even in false persecution against us, we are still to show the attribute of promoting peace. These all work together. All right, here we go. Now, the last part of our review for tonight is that we are to rejoice in persecution. Rejoice in persecution. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. The Lord Jesus Christ says to rejoice and be exceeding glad. I don't know about you, but in my flesh, I sure don't feel like rejoicing when I'm being persecuted. The Bible says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. If and when, I should say when, persecution comes our way, not because of our own stubbornness or self-righteous attitude, but because of a stance that we have taken as a true believer in Jesus Christ, because our intentions were pure in heart, because we are truly standing up for our Savior, and when we are persecuted in that situation, the Bible says that we are to rejoice and be exceeding glad. So you might ask, how does a child of God rejoice in persecutions? Well, we can rejoice in persecutions because we know that it is a demonstration of our identity. It says in the latter part of our verse, For so persecuted they the prophets which were before us, which were before you. It is that persecution that identifies us as part of the Christian faith. We never experience any kind of ridicule, criticism, or rejection because of our faith. We probably have good reason to examine the genuineness of what we believe. Joseph was persecuted by his brethren. Down in Egypt, he was cast into prison for righteousness' sake. Joseph was thrown into prison for a crime he did not even commit. Moses was reviled again and again. You can look through Exodus, through Numbers, all that. Samuel was rejected. Elijah was despised. Daniel was persecuted, thrown into the lion's den. Stephen, when he was stoned. Peter and John cast into prison. James was beheaded. The apostle Paul stoned, left for dead. Rejoice and be exceeding glad doesn't sound that easy. 
We can rejoice in persecution because we know that God uses persecution sometimes to refine us. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, where you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through the manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, Though be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Might not feel joyful, but remember, everything God does for us is for our good. We can rejoice in persecution because it gives us an opportunity to show the difference that Christ makes in a person's life. If everything's going well with you and you rejoice, what makes you a lot different from all the non-believers around you? But what about the times in our life of trials, persecutions? We can show the world the difference of what it is to have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. And again, I go back to blessed are the peacemakers. So, blessed. Peacemakers rejoice and be exceeding glad. I thank you for your attention to the Word of God this evening, and we'll go ahead and close there. And uh, let's stand to be together. Let's stand to be dismissed in a word of prayer.